Within the Cretaceous layering, uh, adjacent to uh, the layers that we work in, in Glen Rose, mm -hmm. adjacent to that, uh, and included in that, there is a worldwide distribution. Yes. There's a layer that runs continentally throughout the United States, throughout mm -hmm. Canada, your home turf, mm -hmm. throughout South America, the very same system of layering. Yep. Picks up at the White Cliffs of Dover, runs throughout Europe, throughout Israel, throughout South America, throughout Russia, throughout Asia. West runs throughout uh, uh, not only Canada North, but Australia, uh, West, and uh, runs throughout the Orient. It is a global sedimentary deposit. Yes. Now, how do you get sedimentary deposits in place? Well, uh, it's funny. I'm, I'm very glad you brought that specific layer up, the Austin Chalk. Wow. Now, I almost feel sorry for the guy here, okay, for, for uh, Carl Bau, um, because I... I, I I have to, I almost think that he really believes what he's saying here. Um and I don't know what that indicates, but that's it's pretty sad. Um worldwide chalk layer? There really is a worldwide chalk layer. Um same strata goes all over the entire known globe. Uh is a ridiculous statement, okay? The Austin chalks formed in one section of of the of the ancient ocean, the White Cliffs of Dover formed in a different one. They're not a continuous layer. They're not even the same age. They overlap in part, of, if I recall correctly. But the fact of the matter is, is that the late Cretaceous, the second half of the Cretaceous, was an excellent time for chalk formation in that there were lots and lots of shallow seas with the perfect conditions for chalk. Now there's something really hilarious um, I have found, and I've seen this before, when creationists use chalk deposits as evidence of a flood, um, it, it's it's got to be one of the funniest things out there because, um, again, it's deliberate misrepresentation of the facts. Now I'm gonna just I did a video on chalk um, in the age of the earth. If I think about it, I'll put a link in the crotch bar. But um, I'm just gonna briefly, hope well, as brief as I can be. Um, talk about chalk. Now, I've done a, I do a number of lectures in my oceanography course. I've done um, that I've taught on chalk formation um, because it's a really important. It's actually important for a lot of reasons. It actually has heavy implications for fisheries um, because uh, the organisms that cause that make up chalk are primarily a what's called a nanoplankton called um, coccolithophores. Okay. Now these coccoliths. Uh, are very very tiny. Okay, I mean they're small. Um, again, they're called nanoplankton, um, and their 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 skeletons are composed of a number of basic, usually disc shaped plates. Um, and they're just a few microns in diameter. I mean these are really really tiny, uh, to all but the most powerful of microscopes. And because of this fact, they tend to accumulate on the seafloor very very slowly. And in fact in most places in the world where there are periodic coccolith blooms, um, you'll find no evidence of coccoliths. You have to take sediment samples and you have to basically sort it under a high-powered microscope and you'll find a coccolith shell here, a coccolith shell there. The only time they accumulate in pure quantities is in absolutely calm, still, no current oceans. Okay, does that make sense? Um, it has to be a shallow um, it has to be a, a whole bunch of conditions. It has to be nutrient rich, shallow, usually warm. They 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 do much better with warmth than things like diatoms. Um, but the thing is with coccolis. Now this is what's amazing about what I think is neat about them. Well, you know, in a way, is that they're opaque. Um, what this means is is that when there is a coccolis bloom, uh, they tend to they tend to choke themselves off from sunlight. Okay. Um, when there's a big bloom, like we get them in the Bering Sea, and they still occur off of England, um, a coccolith bloom turns the water, it looks like milk. I mean, it literally looks like the water is turned to milk. Um, what this does is, is because, well, you know, white reflects sunlight, only the top layer of coccoliths are getting sunlight for photosynthesis. Just millimeters below them, it's dark. They're not getting any more sunlight, and they die. Okay, so the whole bloom, they bloom, turn the water to milk, and then days later, the whole thing crashes and the water's crystal clear again. Um, this might happen, depending on the oceanic conditions, several times per year. Um, but just for fun, scientists studying, oceanographers studying these, and the reason that these are important, by the way, is that they don't just kill off themselves. They actually kill off all the other plankton. Um, Coccoliths aren't very useful 
for planktivorous organisms, um, the, the, the copepods and things that feed on, on diatoms, don't, can't do much. They're, these uh, nanoplankton are way too small for them to, to successfully filter. Um, so they're, it's useless for food, and it kills off the stuff that's good for food. It kills off the other algae, so if that makes sense. So these blooms are actually looked on as a noxious bloom. Um, they, they, we watch them very carefully in the Bering Sea because a, a g good couple of years of coca lift blooms usually can, can result in a crash of, of commercially important fish species because, you know, down the food web. Um, but anyway, so looking at these coca lift blooms, trying to optimize it, scientists did a couple of, of, of experiments looking at saying, okay, what would be if we gave coca lifts everything they needed? Fertilizer, I mean, literally set up the condition, the best possible condition for a coca lift bloom. Um, let it run all year long, so every time it would crash, it would repopulate, crash, repopulate. Uh, so in other words, orders of magnitude more productivity than naturally ever occurs with coca lifts, okay? How much would they accumulate on the seafloor? Because remember, these things are uh, microns in size. How long would it take for them to accumulate um, you know, a, a sizable layering? And it was calculated that it's less than one millimeter per year under absolutely non-existent optimized conditions. One millimeter per year. Okay. Now, when you see these chalk beds like the Austin chalks, um, and I'm not sure how thick the Austin chalks actually are, um, but I know like the White Cliffs of Dover, um, that chalk deposit in, in Western Europe uh, is like 200 plus meters thick, okay? That's 200 plus meters accumulating at less than one millimeter per year in, because the, the, because at least in, for the majority of its range, it's pure. Um, there's a few other, I mean, there's fossils and things found in it, but it's overall almost pure coca lists, right? Um, which means that they had to accumulate under a really peculiar, very stable conditions, a shallow sea with no, absolutely no currents. And the reason that currents are important for coca lith formation, um, for coca lith deposit formation, is that because these shells are so small, they get mixed with other sediments very, very easily. They, they tend to drift. They don't sink very quickly. Um, it takes really, really calm conditions for any sizable amount of coca lith to build up. So we know that the Austin chalks, the White Cliffs of Dover, and the, all the other chalk deposits in the world had to form under this particular condition. They do not form under turbulent conditions, under turbid conditions, um, because remember, they're already, they already caused water to be turbid themselves, um, which kills off the bloom. So they require these, these really specific set of uh, very clear water, very nutrient-rich water, um, little or no competition with other algaes, and a shallow, you know, all of these things. Now, the flood, as proposed by the creotards, is, first of all, it's mixed seawater and freshwater. Coccolis are absolutely intolerant of even a minute change in salinity. Um, they require whatever the 32 um, salinity units of seawater. That they basically pure fresh, pure ocean water is what they require for life. They can't tolerate any change in it. So they cannot live where there's freshwater inflow or even a small change in salinity. So this fountains of the deep and the clouds opening up and flooding the earth with rainwater and water from the all the other crap that these guys in, envision is absolutely lethal to coca lithophores and would not wouldn't and even if it weren't the chalk deposits would be extremely mixed you would never find in a global flood e even a, a few millimeters of pure chalk deposited let alone hundreds of meters thick of it so for them to use this, sorry for the long explanation, but I think it's important to get across. Uh, chalk is the worst possible thing. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show the, the, the next clip here. Again, the clams tell a story. And we discussed this very briefly on the show before, but I studied hundreds of fossil clams in that formation. That tells us exactly how it was deposited. It's supposed to be a calm, placid sea. There's nothing calm and placid nothing about calm. it. Yes. First of all, it covers pretty much the entire globe. Secondly, those clams, after studying hundreds of them, not one of them were in the living position. They've been tumbled and ripped up from their living position. That Isn't takes that interesting. It, it takes a powerful force yeah, of water. A mud. lot of turbulence. <laughs> a lot of turbulence. Now, my main reason for showing that last clip um, is I just to, to implant in your mind. Remember, he's making the claim that the clams in the in the Austin chalk were ripped from their 
beds and tumbled about and 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 that he studied hundreds of them and that you know that that this was an extremely chaotic system now as i explained remember chalk doesn't form under under um turbid conditions it doesn't form under under turbulent conditions um and if it does form in any capacity it's going to be heavily mixed it will not be pure chalk um but anyway the point is, is keep that keep that in mind okay this is this is clam beds being I'm assuming the flood water's washing through, flooding the bed, clams being thrown into the water column and then deposited in this Austin chalk. That's what he's saying. Now, I'm not entirely sure what qualifications uh, old Mr. Juby has for determining, you know, a clam's living position. Um, I doubt he's got any training in taphonomy. So, but anyway, that that that's all an aside. Just keep that in mind, okay? Remember that. Remember the conditions that he set for the Austin chalk. Now yeah. I'm again interested in yes. why his neck is arched back like. Well, that. he's not the only one. When we take a look in the fossil record, to say that it is commonplace is an understatement. These are all from in various museums, and again, it's a huge fossil. That is. That's that plate. This is on the in the Royal Terrell Museum in Alberta. That plate there is probably uh, about five foot by seven foot. It was actually pretty small for a dinosaur, an Albertosaurus, uh, but it's commonplace. Okay, this uh, creation story, creationist story about the death pose found by di in dinosaurs is old. It goes uh, back to back to the seventies at least. I believe Dwayne Gish discussed it. Um, and the idea is is that since some dinosaur fossils are found with their neck bent backwards, that this was the death pose that they were actually killed, you know, that 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 some highly rapid burial destructive force, you know, that in other words, proof that that we captured them at the moment of death, um, which would have only happened if it was a worldwide flood. That's kind of the, the argument that they're making. And there's a, a number of flaws with it. One of them, which is, is that um, we know. The majority of the of the fossils that display that backwards neck neck thing, it's not just backwards. You leave out the ones where the neck flop forward or the neck flop sideways. You know, you can you could easily show eight pictures of fossils with that going on. The fact is, is that the head, the the long neck thing, is in the direction of the water flow, um, and the ones the specific ones that they like to to use for this are dinosaurs that are found in river deposits. Okay, meaning their carcasses washed downstream. Um, and and got whatever hung up in pot. They tend to find these piles of these things with all of the the tails and on the on the flexible tailed species. These the ones that he shows here. The theropods are not good for that because the tails are pretty stiff. But the neck is bent in the direction of water flow. So um, anyway, just I wanted to point that out. Now the reason I stopped at an ostrich ranch is because this may have a clue to why we find them like this. All right. I had been told that ostriches, when they die, their heads tilt back and their legs tuck up. So I stopped into this ostrich ranch and I specifically asked them. And the owner, who's been ranching ostriches since the late 80s at least, said, yes, it is true. Uh, you can often tell a chick is sick because its head will start to arch back. I see. But the moment they die, their head goes completely loose. And you will find them dead in any position. I specifically asked them on this. So I question what of what value is um, looking into how an ostrich dies uh, when you are trying to explain the position of a dinosaur skeleton when uh, dinosaurs and birds have no common ancestry, share nothing in common with each other, um, especially considering the fact that um, well, lots of birds today, most birds, apparently ostriches, I don't know, but other birds certainly don't die like that. Um, um, it's certainly not. I mean, I've raised chickens. I've raised turkeys. They don't put their head back when they die. Uh, modern lizards and snakes don't do that when they die. Uh, so apparently it's just dinosaurs and ostriches that did. Um, just kind of something to think about. Now, yeah. that made a dynamic statement. Yes, and an important one. <laughs> Applying this means that he was caught so rapidly by the deposition, by the material covering him, <laughs> that he was in the process of dying. He had not already yes. died. He was in the process of dying because of the arch context. Exactly. And probably, Major. probably dying of asphyxiation. He was yes. arching back his head trying to get air, most likely. I thought ostriches did this when they were sick. Um, but this one was asphyxiating, gasping for air. There's a, you're, you're telling two different, he's telling two different stories there about these, um, how this death pose occurs.